Hi everyone, Julie here. You know, sometimes when I do interviews, I interview people who haven't had a chance to do interviews very often, but I'm very interested in what they have to say and the unique contributions they might be able to make. And that's why I'm interested in talking with them. And other times I interview people who have actually been interviewed a lot. And la that happened last week when I had the chance to sit down with the Honorable Brian Peckford. And Brian Peckford, if you've clicked on this interview, you probably know him, you've probably even heard him speak before. He's the last living minister of the process that led to signing the Constitution Act in 1982. And that's such an important piece of Canadian history and he gives such valuable insight into the nature of our Constitution and how it's supposed to work and the kinds of protections and obligations it gives us. But we talked about so many other things. Of course we talked about COVID, but we also looked, talked about what we can learn from the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome, what happiness is all about. We talked about Brexit and we talked about uh, the identity crisis that Canadians seem to be feeling right now. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation. If you want to hear more like it, you can follow us, subscribe on YouTube, The Democracy Fund. You can go to our website, thedemocracyfund.ca, or follow me, Dr. Julie Panessi, or The Democracy Fund on Twitter or Instagram. Enjoy the conversation. I feel a bit like things have been quite quiet in some sense, since, especially since the end of the convoy in Ottawa is almost a little eerie. Um, and then, you know, the mask mandates lifted in Ontario a couple of weeks ago and, and, and other places across the country. It feels a little like a calm after a storm or maybe a calm before a superstorm or something. But what, what, do, what, do you, what are your general feelings about where we're at right now? Well, <clears throat> I, I think we're in an extremely difficult uh, position right now as a country. Uh, I think you're, you're right when you uh, surmise in your question about um, the whole COVID and pandemic kind of situation and what it led to and the convoy and now the little airy silence we have afterwards. Um, I, I, think, um, I think some Canadians are becoming more reflective about our situation as a result of perhaps uh, comments by you and me and others who have been sort of doing the commentary on the issue of our individual rights and freedoms and so on. I think there are some who are, do, are reflected. I think there's though still a large, quite like there's still a majority who have uh, decided to just settle in for the long term in the sense that we're right and you're wrong. And um, we believe in what all the governments have done was necessary, legal, constitutional, and everything else. I, I, I find that in my um, talks like this across the country, I've done now over a hundred, uh, and you know all in every all the provinces and stuff, and in rural communities as well as more urban communities, um, there is this small minority who, you know, like I, I did a. I, I did a Zoom like this to people in Kitimat and Terrace and Kamloops uh, in northern BC, okay, where they had to come to halls to sit down and listen on Zoom, then come up to the desk or up to the table at the front of the hall to ask their question afterwards. Uh, and these are ordinary blue collar people, hardworking people in rural British Columbia, could be rural anywhere in Canada. And I did it in the Northwest Territories in Hay River, for example. I did it in numerous churches all over, rural and, and uh, urban. And uh, so I'm finding there's a core of people who sense that there's something fundamentally wrong. And some of them even raised the issue of like trying to contact their MLA, trying to contact their MP. Uh, very, very difficult in all the provinces to contact anybody mm -hmm. who's elected. And then you get, if you write them, you get this generic letter back that goes out to everybody who writes them on the, this particular issue. So I think there's, a, there's an unease among a significant minority, at least, uh, that uh, things are not right here in the country. And they see it manifested now that they, for the first time, some of them, have contacted their MLA and now realize that what their friends had said or somebody had told them that it was difficult to get hold of their elected representative, federally or provincially, is true. 
<laughs> and of course, some of them have even gone municipally and found how difficult it was to get a meeting with the mayor or with a councillor, and that they kept putting you off and sending you uh, emails or something as a, once again a standard response. So I think there is a general feeling of malaise among a fair number of people manifested through the, the truckers convoy and other convoys that are still going on mm -hmm. in various parts of the country. And they're beginning to now realize uh, how, how fragile democracy is uh, for the first time. I mean, when you have a mother and three kids turn up at a church that's overloaded with people and people waiting outside to hear someone like me talk about the Charter Rights and Freedoms, you know, not, not an easy subject for ordinary people to, to, to consume and understand in one night. And that she took her three kids, nine, I think six and five, and set them down two weeks before the meeting, knowing that the meeting was really gonna happen and explained to them that she was going to take them to this church, to this building, to uh, sit down and listen to somebody explain about their constitution and sit there for three hours without <clears throat> making a murmur. Um, and this young mother was like, perhaps in her early thirties at most, and she took all that time to do that. You know, right? You know that there is a sense amongst <clears throat> a lot of people uh, that we have a problem. As you know, and I know, this didn't happen just with the pandemic. It happened a long time ago where we got very lazy and allowed just everything to happen in our parliaments without checking on our MLAs in between elections or our MPs. And that the power shift, as I always talk about it, from the parliament to the cabinet, to the prime minister's office, and also the premier's office is real. And that we're really controlled for all intents and purposes by a small coterie of people around the prime minister or around the premier. And that everybody else sort of acts as servants to that. Uh, now sort of sort of autocrat if you will and uh, people have Canadians I think one of our biggest problems is we've had difficulty in the last five years understanding that our health care was in crisis and I've been writing about this for longer than that and um, I get that you know complete well I really don't believe you Brian you know I know we all have our problems but we still have the best health care system in the world when we've not got now perhaps the second last worst ones in the OECD. So there is a reluctance by Canadians, <clears throat> nice Canadians, to acknowledge that we have not problems, that we have very, very serious problems and they're getting worse. And I think it manifested itself, like I say, in my, <clears throat> in my talks and writings long before the pandemic, and I can use the health uh, system as one example, the educational system as another example. And uh, for example, uh, and I'll stop and let you decipher out what you will and ask another question. <clears throat> Listen to this. The World Bank, of which they have 195 or 200 countries in it, every few years does a, a number of studies. One of the studies they do is the ease at doing business in their member countries. And they have perfected the mythology on this so that very few countries or experts question uh, the validity of their studies. To take one example, how long does it take for a citizen to get an electrical permit for their house or for their small business? Canada ranks 122nd in the world on how long it takes for a citizen to get an electrical permit to build their house. 122nd, there are 121 countries in the world that issue electrical permit to the citizens faster than they do in Canada. And on a construction permit, we're 64th. And I use these as examples. And when I've used them, like in the last two years, in small groups of four or five where I'm having coffee uh, in a coffee shop. 
and we aren't very ed well educated, not well, I should say, formally educated people, very formally educated people. They question me, and I usually have my iPad with me, and I click right into the World Bank, click right into that study, and I have to show them because they don't believe me. I have to show them. So it seems to me that over the last decade for sure, mm -hmm. Canadians have become less and less interested in their civic politics, doing their own thing in their own little bubble, just thinking that the world will unfold as it should in a manner which is consistent with their values and they don't have to do anything about it. There's so much, thank you for all of that insight. There's so much there to unpack. I wanna ask you about this sort of psychological phenomenon of apathy and how we got there. But first, since you mentioned the sort of the global context, you know, last week, I think it was the world, what was they called? The World Government Summit met in Dubai. And it was apparently incredibly well attended and full of the usual suspects, you know, Gates yes. and, and Klaus Schwab and all these people. Um, so when you say that actually, you know, all of our government officials are really falling in line with a small number of people who work in the prime minister's office, I think most Canadians think that that's where the control stops. That's where the decision-making begins for Canadians. Do you think that's the case? And, or is it the case that there is a greater global influence in Canadian politics than most Canadians think? And if so, is that a bad thing, right? Because some well, people I'm might a, think, you know. I, I think it's a bad thing on the political side. I don't think it's a bad thing on the economic side, if in fact mm. uh, uh, you, you negotiate um, trade agreements without without reducing the sovereignty of your country. Mm. That's where I draw the line. I'm a strong nation state person. I, I, I read history, I studied history, uh, I studied economic history, I studied political history, I still read it every day. I have the books around me. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it before I went on this interview, I, I was reading. So I'm a reader and a strong reader in history and economic history and political history. And my conclusion has been for some time now that the world will be better served by a collection of nation states than they will by moving towards some kind of mysterious, undefined world government, uh, which leads to more unelected people being involved in the governance of the of the of the world, and uh, I go back to the Hanseatic League, when back in the late Middle Ages, people were trading from Italy all the way to Bergen, Norway, through the river systems of Europe. I've been in Bergen, and I've seen the buildings and the the the, um, the descriptions of the uh, trade that happened all the way to Bergen, Norway all the way down to the river systems uh, into uh, in the, right to Italy, you know, when Venice and Genoa and these countries, nation states were strong. And so, you know, and trade was very much a part of Athens, of democratic Athens. So Athens became great, not just because they had some good leadership for a period of time, several different times in their ancient history before Jesus, long before Jesus, in the three and 400 BC area, era, uh, and but they also had great trade, okay. But they were completely independent as a nation state and were very successful in several uh, epochs of their history. Mm. So it, it goes back a long while. But if you look at these things, you begin to realize that, uh, from a point of view of language, culture, geography, history, uh, all intertwined, of course, uh, that uh, a person. If, if happiness is one of your goals philosophically, then one of the ways to reach it must be through some common threads amongst those homo sapiens, amongst those people. Mm -hmm. This can only be achieved, it seems to me, through language and culture, which you use every day, right? And through your history and having some common- A common values. understanding or something about- Yes, and so to me, 
So when you see international organizations move from uh, an economic uh, trade agreement mm -hmm. where you agree to trade different goods, you can produce this better than I. I don't have wheat fields, you do, right? I have, uh, I have mining, you don't, and so on. And you do this kind of interchange. I think that's very helpful and, and necessary because we must, you know, get along with one another and we must be involved with one another in order to have a successful planet. And the so, goods aren't distributed equally across the world. So some right. countries are in places that have happen to have more minerals or more oil. Yeah, precisely, more precisely. And so it seems, so I now in the last like 40 or 50 years, when you see all of these uh, international the United Nations and then all of these international um, organizations form, and then you start doing international agreements, uh, I, I stop at the door of, a nation state, right? You, you must not interfere uh, with the sovereignty of a given nation that has already defined itself, already mm -hmm. has a parliament, already has a lot of the instruments through which they can successfully become mm -hmm. or are a nation, right? And so yeah, uh, I so am very concerned about what's happening as it relates to the World Economic Forum and these world government. Um, and I just spent some time on the weekend looking up the World Economic Forum and all of the the people who went through their program. Well, just about every person in the world who's in an executive position. In politics of any kind. Both in politics <laughs> and in business. Business. Mm -hmm. And in business. All the leading uh, uh, accounting firms, all the leading, right, like the McKinsey's of this world, all of these Drug leading companies. people who are advising governments all over the world, all of them, all of their executives have been through this program having this common notion of a more uh, interla internationalized world society in the sense of political as well as economic. And therefore, I think, uh, as you just said about that recent meeting, uh, they're already convinced that this is the way to go. And so we, you and I and others are bringing up the rear almost, uh, sort of a rear guard action to start saying, hold on one second, how far are you going with this? I think it was the British farmer, for example, who suddenly realized that he had to contact Brussels about how many bushels of wheat he could grow next year, or what kind of grading system he had to use for his eggs or for his meat, that he suddenly said, oh, oh this has gone too far, and uh, where is London in all of this, right? And so uh, I, I think um, uh, that's one of the reasons why Briex succeeded, is that suddenly there was enough DNA of the Magna Carta still in the British soul or in the British <laughs> blood to, to say, hold on right now, I'm, I'm, right? I'm losing control as an individual and as a, as a community, and we've got to stop this. So I think Brexit is a really good example of, of people who have a history of uh, yeah, individual rights and freedoms, a, a history of yeah, the development of a parliamentary democracy that actually stopped it. There were other people involved who articulated it, perhaps better than the farmer, like Roger Scruton, the late Roger Scruton, who the great English philosopher who was strongly opposed to Briex, who's one of my heroes. Um, I think people like him helped, but I, at its core, I think the individual uh, British farmer and small business person had a strong sense that once again, something had gone too far. Uh, which is very interesting because I remember at the time thinking that it was going to go the other way. And it's so interesting retrospectively to look to to understand that that that's maybe what was in the kind of the common psyche of the British people. But I think this point you're making about uh, globalism and distinguishing between its economic aspect and virtues and its political economic aspect and questionable virtues is very interesting because uh, I think often when people give an argument in defense of globalization, they they do so by appealing to the kinds of economic reasons you give, right? So they'll say, well, globalization is good or necessary because we have to be able to trade with other people and we need to break down the boundaries of, of commerce and so that it's easier to facilitate these kinds of transactions in the modern world, blah, blah, blah without realizing that economic globalization is not the only kind or the only kind that matters or maybe the most important kind. So it's interesting, I think, to think a little bit more about what we 
lose or maybe gain or at least trade off when we blur the boundaries between nation states you know and uh, you mentioned being a reader I'm a reader too and a few months ago I was reading Walt Whitman kind of for the second time in my life I, oh, wow. I encountered, pardon I said wow <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think I read him in grad school because I needed a break from philosophy. So I thought, well, I'll read some <laughs> literature and poetry, which is still pretty philosophical. But anyway, uh, then I came back to it last fall. And there's one thing he said that struck me immensely. He said that, you know, long after the great civilizations of the past, like Greece and Rome, fall and long after their buildings crumble and their roadways fall apart and and you know maybe even their particular their, their legal systems collapse and their particular sculptures and paintings are disintegrate what we're left with is the idea the ideas of those people you know the ideas of what it was to be great right. what it was to be free and what aesthetics right. were and what virtue and heroism and those ideas right. so when you were talking about you know, the nation state that is Canada and us having an identity that we maybe don't want to lose or give up or trade right. away for the sake of convenience or a place on the economic stage or whatever. It makes me wonder what are our, what is our identity? What is our right. lineage? What is it that makes us uniquely Canadian? Um, you know, and then to return to that point you made earlier about this kind of malaise among the people, or maybe we right. call it a sort of apathy or a lack of interest in ideas or someone else will take care right. of me. Where, if we're losing so much, you know, where do we find our identity these days, do you think? Uh, really good question. Um, and uh, first of all, let me say, I went back uh, to, you know, I, I did a lot of English literature at the university as well as, a, as history. I graduated with a degree in education, but I did a lot of, of side <laughs> studies in, in uh, English uh, literature and in um, economic history. And then I went back uh, a couple of summers later to university because I heard of a lady from the United States who was going to do a special course on American literature. And she was one of the sort of the foremost scholars in, in that field at the time. And she was coming to Memorial University just for one summer to do this American literature course, which I had not done. Most of my <laughs> literature was both French and English, mainly English literature, of course. Uh, the Romantic poets, the metaphysical poets, Shakespeare and so on, okay? And that's where my emphasis was which I enjoyed immensely. I'm a great fan of Wordsworth, for example. And, uh, and I taught Shakespeare in grade seven. I actually introduced the Shakespeare in grade seven in the school. Nowhere else in the province was Shakespeare being taught that. in grade seven. And, <laughs> and, and when I left, it, it left too, unfortunately. So when you talk about um, Walt Whitman, that's when I was introduced to Walt Whitman that summer by this American female professor who was just absolutely unbelievable I was so happy I did it that I remember it right to this day you know that's like a long long time ago 50 years ago uh, and and so but I still remember it and yeah Walt Whitman became you know so I studied Walt Whitman at the time and I'm so um, um, pleased to be here today to listen to someone like you uh, and who had only a week ago or whatever, a few days ago, looked and, and read Walt Whitman. Uh, to your everlasting credit, may I say. Uh, I, I, uh, and, but his point was what is well taken. Who was it who said just, uh, I, saw, I read somebody who said, re, um, and I definitely read it recently, but I remember reading it some time ago, uh, defining Canada or Canadians were not American. Uh, somebody had said, the only way we can define a, a Canadians is we're not American. I think one of the great problems that we naturally inherited was that the United States became a country in 1776 and had, it, by the way, a Bill of Rights in 1791. So they were only about 15 years after becoming a country that they added to their constitution to define, if you will, or sections of their constitution which dealt with individual rights and freedoms. I make these two points because we were part, as they were, of the whole British system, if you will, for want of a better term, 
and uh, the people who came to the United States uh, decided that the monarchy and the, the way that the British were treating them in, uh, in that part of North America was not sufficient for their needs and they needed to break out and be their own country and so on. And of course, as we know, that led to a lot of uh, problems and, and uh, a revolution and then later uh, a civic problem in the late 1800s. Right. And so uh, we then became, we were British North America and, and interesting, isn't it, that our first constitutional, written constitutional document is called the British North America Act, the BNA Act. This is very important psychologically, I think, because, right? Um, so we did not go through the turmoil, tragedy, mm. uh, success, uh, and all of the mixture that goes to perhaps make the fabric of the human person in the same way that America did. And then America became very, uh, grew very fast and became very prosperous and much larger in economy, right? And in people than Canada. And then Canada comes along and through the BNA Act uh, and some very um, smart elite uh, politicians in central Canada, especially upper Canada and lower Canada, which became Ontario and Quebec. So I think then we became a country. It was Canada uh, and we had gone through an 1812, 1814 experience before that. Um, so I think in my experience anyway, uh, it's always been the mouse li living next door to the elephant. And over time that has had an extremely um, strong influence over trying to define who we are as a nation. And I think um, that, that kind of thread and, and, and stuff, uh, once you really try to peel it away, uh, says a lot. For example, when Newfoundland uh, ran, uh, became part of Canada, um, we had a referendum. And on the ballot in the first referendum was an economic union with the United States, as well as staying independent, as well as joining Canada. And on the first ballot, the economic union of the United States got dropped off. And by the way, it was John Crosby's father who fought for that. And, and then there was only two left and, the, and then it was 51-49 in joining uh, Canada. And so in 1949, we joined Canada, 51% being the, the number, 49% uh, saying stay independent. And then after we came part of Canada, and as I grew up as a boy, um, I was more familiar early on with my aunt going to Boston, not to Toronto. <laughs> all, all Newfoundlanders and Maritimes, Maritimers even who became Canadians, looked to the Boston states, as we called it. And most of the people in the Maritimes went to Boston and New York and helped build Boston and New York. Hmm. There are Newfoundlanders who will tell you about their uncles and grandfathers and so on, and they'll help build uh, you know, some of the buildings, the skyscrapers in New York. And there was a Newfie club in, in, in New York and there was a Newfie club in Boston for many years. I, get, I give you that example only as one part of Canada and there was a late part of Canada. But me as a Canadian, I was seven years old when we became Canadians. I was born just a Newfoundlander. But, and my growing up, right? And now traveling, and now I live in British Columbia and after I left politics, I was in the consulting work. And I tell you all of this because I think it's important. So I've been in every part of Canada, every single jurisdiction, the three territories, the 10 provinces, and I've done business in almost all of them, as well as a, as a politician dealing with premiers and ministers from all of these for 10 years, okay? <clears throat> so I think I have perhaps a unique experience. And now I live in British Columbia, which is on an island, off the Pacific coast, born on an island, off the <laughs> coast. Okay, so your book I think I bring country. Your book ends. People ask me why I moved to British Columbia. I said it was my way of trying to keep Canada together. <laughs> but it's a very valiant my, effort. 
if, if you're to follow my trend, so it seems to me that we've always had this um, doing things different than America, even if it didn't make any sense. <clears throat> right? right. We, we, were, we had that anti-American because it's the elephant next to the mouse. We had to trade with them or we had to get our fruit from them and some of our vegetables because they couldn't grow it here. So America was always in your face, either on your table <laughs> or in your television or in your, right, in, in your culture, in your radios. I, I listened to American baseball on a battery operated radio in 1954 in Marystown, Newfoundland. <laughs> and that was, that possible. <laughs> and that was communicated because there was a Air Force base in Argentia across the bay from Marystown, Placentia Bay, and I was able to hook in with it and then get all the baseball games. And I learned Ameri American baseball, of course, um, mm. through radio in a, in a remote part of Newfoundland in 1954. And so the influence then of the American system in all its forms, right down to its sport, is very much ingrained into a lot of Canadians. That makes it, <clears throat> that makes it more difficult. <clears throat> if you go to Slovenia, which was part of Yugoslavia, and which a lot of people work in Austria next door, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they talk about, I went to Slovenia, and I remember sitting down at the coffee shop in Ljubljana and talking to a, uh, Slovenians, most of them could speak English, and talking to me about Austria like we would talk about um, talking about America. And then if you go to Austria, right, they'll talk about Germany right, <laughs> in the same way as we talk about America. Okay, so only it wasn't sort of as pronounced because they weren't the influence wasn't that much because there's some language, you know, commonalities and so on. But mm -hmm. you get my drift, and so in. In Canada, even though we're geographically a bit larger, every other way we were, quote unquote, smaller. And so I don't know how that fits into the whole thing, but it makes it more difficult. One could also say, which is quite interesting, because I'm a provincialist, but it's quite interesting. A federal state in the second largest country in the world lends itself to provincial and regional concerns, perhaps more sometimes than mm. national concerns. So the very nature of our country politically tends to inhibit the commonality that one would otherwise see in a unitary state. And so- You mean the geographical size? Yes, and, and, and mm -hmm. you know, there are, there are parts of the country like in, in British Columbia and in Newfoundland or in Prince Edward Island, where they're more an Islander or Prince Edward Islander than they are Canadian, Canadian. Mm -hmm. in the way they operate their day-to-day -day uh, you know, lives. So mm -hmm. that may play into it too. But the long and short of it is we are where we are and we, we need, I, I think the big thing for us to be able to do is to identify what I just said. And I don't think many Canadians have gone through that process as of identifying you know, what are the strands? How did we become a country, right? What happened through all of that, for that first century? And then uh, sort of acknowledging that build our own nation in, in its own way, in its own forms. But that has been very difficult to do because of the stronger and stronger impact that communications and technology has had over our lives, especially mm -hmm. over the last 50 years, most of it being America. So yeah, it's, it's very yeah. hard to define Canadian mm -hmm. and a Canadian in that sense. It's very interesting. I mean, back to what you were saying earlier, it, it sounds a bit like maybe your view is that the Americans were sort of forced to engage with questions about who they were, who they are Good earlier point. than than we were. And we've always kind of been able to get out of it, maybe in a way, but that we are now seeing the the, li the lineage of that avoidance. And, and that coupled maybe, as you say, with the fact that we are so um, spread out and so are, are you know, and, and that we have islands that are provinces that are just ge geographically distinct. For whatever reason, we do, I think, as you say, seem to have this identity crisis. 
but that that's made um, insidiously damaging, I think, yeah. by our disinterest in confronting. Yeah right yeah. we don't this idea we, we've been talking about kind of apathy haven't we all throughout but this yes. idea, so many people are you know and I mean it's so easy to blame others and say well the problem lies with others you know but you do notice this feeling of just a lack of interest in ideas a lack of interest in questioning a very a, a strong willingness to embrace whatever the status quo is yeah and that's um you know, I think a symptom of a lack of not just ability to engage in critical thinking, but an interest in it. Right, right. And I, I think linked into, I, I agree, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. And I think linked into that is the political reality <coughs> of it, that that charter of rights and freedoms that we're now trying to uphold and trying to defend <laughs> is only 40 years old. And the, the Americans is 114 years old. So, and we looked as Canadians on our television and watched these people in America up defending their Bill of Rights. Like, I mean, it was the last thing in the whole world. And I mean, we had a job, I think, for a while, understanding what it was all about. What are, what are you talking about? What are you, <laughs> up, you know, banging so hard on, on this thing all the way to guns rights, right? Because, right, the, the founders in, the, in America looked upon it as we needed government Right, we needed to organize, right? But they also understood, if you read the Federalist Papers, they also understood the business of, you've also got to put some things in there to protect you from government so that it doesn't get too big and too uh, infiltrate too much of our lives, right? There was a, this delicate balance, right? This, this dynamic tension Locke, I yeah, think, between right? the individual mm -hmm. and government in the United States right, manifested through its constitution a lot more than in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other thing, that the political instruments which created their nation and created ours were much different and allowed for, right? And then, the, of course, the, the actual um, blood being spilt, right, between North and South and then forming the country in the beginning, uh, as you say, makes them far more mindful of what they fought for um, you know, and how we, to protect at, themselves yes from government yeah. yes mm -hmm. exactly and how to protect themselves from government our experience especially from the 50 middle 50s on 1950s on has been one of more and more government mm -hmm. and of course they've done it now in many parts of the united states and in the, and in the federal government too but so and, and we did not resist that at all as some of the states have done consistently throughout all of this. Mm -hmm. Many of the states, right to this day, 20 to 25 states, you know, taking the federal government of the United States to court over the pandemic uh, measures and so on, which, you know, which you didn't find in Canada. All the problems has just sided immediately with the federal government, which there speaks to what I'm trying to say. So our role politically has been one of more government where theirs has been one of less government or a resisting government to a far greater extent. And that has a meaningful impact down the road to how Canadians responded to all of these government mandates. They just accepted them as being part of the nature of who they have become over the last, especially the last 50 years. And I think when I talk to people in my little development where I am, uh, uh, on the in, in Vancouver Island, that's the reaction I get. Uh, Me as too. a matter of fact, you know, I, I'm here in this 26 unit development. Not one person has come to my door since the pandemic has started to say, I oppose what you're doing, I support what you're doing, or whatever. It's been what do you think? Ask a question. Utter silence. I'm sure. Well, I think I, I, might, I might be wrong about this, and I would invite anybody to to, uh, to to shed light for me, but my guess is the sort of implicit syllogism in a lot of people's minds is government is good, government exactly. is doing X, therefore X is good, right? Yes. Um, that is such an odd, it's an odd view to me, because government is, is nothing more than a collection of people. And unless you think that people are pretty close to perfect, or perfect, yeah. you yeah. should have every reason in the world to question everything right. our government right. asks of us. Right. 
Well, I only had one teacher besides my mom and my dad, <laughs> who were perhaps the best teachers. But I had one teacher, and that was in my last year in high school. I was the most luckiest person in the world because that man changed my life with my dad and mother. But it, from a formal sense, it was that one teacher in one year of school who changed my life. And he changed my life because he started to articulate from the first day we had him in, as our teacher, what you were talking about earlier, about critical thinking and questioning things and trying to understand things and peeling it away to really understand it. Mm -hmm. Don't take it at face value. Uh, and he, he began that from the first day he, he entered the classroom. And so uh, that was my first experience outside of my dad and my mother. And my mother was quite a questioning person as well. But outside of those two, you, uh, then you, you know, as you get older, you, you respect that at least early on, those teachers more than you do your parents, because your parents got to be wrong for a while, right? <laughs> as you grow up and be a teenager, they really don't know very much. You know a lot more than them when you're 16 or 17. Then when you get 30 or 40, you begin to realize how much more your <laughs> parents do than you thought. <laughs> but on the more formal side, in the public education system, where then you get gain more respect for your teachers, well, it was, like I say, outside of um, early on as an elementary school where I learned a lot about discipline because I happened to go to a convent school because my dad was moving around as a social worker and, and I never know, didn't know what a nun was on the, because I was raised as a Protestant. Mm. And in Newfoundland, if you're raised as a Protestant, even if you were going to be exposed to a Catholic, you were, you were shunned, you were encouraged not to because Catholics were one thing and Protestants were another and the, and the Catholics felt the same way about the Protestants. But here we were thrust into <laughs> a Catholic school and the only Protestants going to that convent school in rural Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And uh, but so I, so I taught I was taught a lot about um, discipline and mm -hmm. and uh, rigor and being on time and respecting learning. But that was very early on. And then uh, that fell away. But it came back in grade 11 with this one person who, were, who was talking about critical thinking. And, and I think that's the other part where we have fallen down on the, on the job in our public education system. And it's become more all, <clears throat> all about government <clears throat> and not about uh, questioning different things. So I think we have really moved uh, what I, societally uh, as, a, as a country and as a system more into as you just said earlier, the government really doing a lot of great things and uh, very little questioning of any of it right to this very day. And uh, now there's a covey of people in this community of mine of almost 14,000 people. There's a really good covey of people now who are questioning things for the first time and are coming together and meeting and so on in a much different way than they ever did before. Uh, but it's very late in the day, as we know. Well, that's very good news. You know, it's interesting. I had a chat with Robert Kennedy last week and I asked him about, you know, moving forward, how, how do we sort of ch shift the tide or what are some of the, um, the most promising avenues to try to address some of these problems? And his, I thought his response was quite interesting. He said, well, you know, we have to keep kind of trying to build these small groups, but his observation is that no one ever goes back. You know, once they start to question, things, the government, the narrative, the pandemic response, whatever it is, they never go back to the other side again. And I just thought that was very interesting psychologically. But, you know, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier that you introduced Shakespeare into the schools. Why do you think it's so important for students to learn Shakespeare? Well, I saw through literature and I never realized this on my first year in university, but I did early on in university, thankfully. I, I, I suddenly just, uh, my eyes, I just became open to, wow, all of the great um, lessons one can learn from a play. Me or, too. I remember yeah, that distinctly. Mm -hmm. You do too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really was quite, quite amazing. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it was natural then, as I got into my, I think it was my third year, 
of the university where there was a just a Shakespearean course. And so I, I couldn't get in the course because it was overloaded with students, <laughs> one professor, but another That would professor, never happen today. <laughs> no, and exactly. Another professor decided that he would, you know, try to meet the demand. Mm -hmm. And uh, his class filled up too fast too. But I went to him personally, nobody really knew this and, and uh, said, is, it was, you know, would you please take me too? I know, I'm, you know, I'll just squeeze in through the door and he agreed. So I got, my name got on his list. So I was formally accepted and therefore registered into that course. And I realized through plays and through literature, you learn so much about life. Mm -hmm. And so, and then when I was introduced to Shakespeare, well, at all. I mean, just what can I say? I mean, the one of the greatest writers to ever, uh, you know, be in the world, in the world. And, I can't and believe so, he's one person. I, I, I continue to be in the state of dis disbelief about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so when I read mm -hmm. about Sherlock or when I read about, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. any of the, uh, uh, mid from Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, you know, or Love's Labor's Lost on, and when I looked at the comedies and then the, <clears throat> the histories and then the tragedies, when I finished university and I went teaching and I was teaching English literature as my main teaching subject, <clears throat> I became convinced, you know, because of my experience with Shakespeare, that the one or two, I think it was just one Shakespeare then in, in the last year of school mm -hmm. in Newfoundland at the time, this is back in the 1967-68 period, um, that, uh, you know, this was quite deficient. I mean, our schools were quite deficient in only getting one Shakespeare. And usually that was a tragedy that most teachers didn't even understand. They didn't even have taken Shakespeare in, in university and they were trying to teach Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was impossible to do that, right? That was the other problem. If, if you know anything about Shakespeare's plays, I mean, pretty, pretty difficult to start with Othello right? Or hard to start with King Lear. Anything, really. <laughs> you, you, you know, so you really got to start. So I started in grade seven <clears throat> with Midsummer Night's Dream mm -hmm. and then went up through there, through the comedies, two or three more comedies, then into a couple of histories, especially the Julius Caesar, say, and then into the tragedies as you got into the grade 10 or grade 11. But the reason for it, of course, was is that through Shakespeare, and through literature, you learn so much about character, you learn so much about life uh, as, as lived through these characters. And they're all different settings and all different uh, circumstances that you can relate back to your own existence. And so, you know, I, I found literature to be that very important, powerful lesson to people who were students uh, from, grade, from age 12 to, grade, to age 17 or whatever. And that, that this would be very important for their education, for their learning. Mm -hmm. Not so much the word education is wrong, for their learning, mm -hmm. for their mm -hmm. learning, it would be very important. And um, so, yeah, that's why I, I, that's why I introduced it. And I thought it was an extremely important thing to do. I also introduced civics in school because civics had left the school, but it was still part of the, the provincial curriculum and any school could introduce it if they wanted. Right, and they had tools and stuff there. And so I uh, introduced civics to grade eight uh, because I thought that very important. And there were no, no um, textbooks or anything. So what I just did was, is that I, I taught them the last, the, the last period of, of, of Friday when all the kids were wanting to get out of school, not one kid said, I don't want to come to this class. Oh. <laughs> And so they stayed for that last period of Friday afternoon, and we learned municipal government, provincial government, and federal government. And if we had time in May, we started to compare the Canadian federal system to the American federal system, if we had time. That was the course, no textbook. It was just me writing on the board, mm -hmm. long before computers, writing on the board each time and they could write write it all down right and so we just they just built up a a textbook in their exercise books mm -hmm. over the year 
starting with municipal goal two. And I think that's one of our other problems today is that obviously that should be in the schools as mandatory course. We, we should maybe have another talk again sometime, a whole talk about education, because I okay. think there's, there's so much there to talk about, but it's so beautiful hearing you speak about how, I mean, it's, it's really not the, 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 um, the subject matter of these courses that is so key, is it? It's the fact that they're all vehicles for thinking, right? Exactly. They're, exactly. And, and, you know, and, and we have a, a former teacher and politician and a philosopher sitting down and we've been talking about literature kind of all right. throughout our conversation. And I think on that, the point about Shakespeare you make, I mean, one of the things that's so beautiful about him is that he doesn't shy away from all the imperfections and the messiness of human nature, but he doesn't celebrate it either. Right. And so many, uh, I think, you know, movies now and they really want to delve into the darkest, you know, the dark right. personality traits without right. there being a lesson to learn. But with Shakespeare, it was always, um, you know, these are the things that will tempt you. These are the things that mm -hmm. will make life hard to live. But there's right. beauty in that and there's struggle right. in that and the tragic, you know, hey, we could go on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> I, one, one of my most favorite char characters in Shakespeare is Falstaff. Oh, why is he for, your favorite? For all, for all the reasons you just mentioned. <laughs> he, he, he had a lot of bad uh, characters, but he had a lot of good ones too. And I think he taught Prince Hal a lot. Uh, I think he taught the, the, you know, the, the person who was going to become Henry V a lot. You um, know, to yeah, borrow and, a term from, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's all right. I was just going to say to borrow a term from theology, really, that's often used in, in discussions about um, the, the problem of evil. I think that, you know, Shakespeare was interested in soul making, right? And yes. he was interested yes. in this is the, the course a person has to go through in order to yes. learn what it is to be human, yes. in order maybe to try to do that a little better, even if at the end of the day, you've lost everything anyway. <laughs> you know? yep. Uh, but these are the things, I mean, this is hard work. You often have to break down. It's kind of like uh, like muscle building, right? You have to break down the fibers before they can build up again. And we don't, I think we don't really want to do that work anymore. And I certainly, um, you know, when I started in undergrad in, in ethics classes, uh, it was hard for the professor to control our class because so many people had such strong opinions. Yeah. And then when I started teaching kind of in the mid to the late nineties, I guess, there was a little of that, but you could start to see people pulling back. And by the time I left, and as you might know, I was terminated, right, uh, right. last fall, um, the time I left, you could do everything in your power to try to motivate a discussion in class. And, and it was almost impossible because of whether it's kind of apathy or a fear of, of speaking out. But, you know, as I said, I'm sure we could talk about education for a while, but on that topic of apathy, oddly enough, uh, I think the last week of the convoy in Ottawa, just as the emergency powers were being invoked, I came across I guess it was on YouTube, uh, an episode from The Tonight Show. It was from 1975, which is the year I was born. And Johnny Carson and, had uh, Ronald Reagan on, President Reagan. And uh, Johnny Carson said, oh, you know, and they were talking about all the problems in America. And, 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 and Johnny Carson said, you know, I don't think people are apathetic. I think they're confused. You've got sort of intelligent people on both sides of the political spectrum with different answers to the question about what's going wrong in the country. You have people saying you should let government spend millions of dollars and other people say, no, 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 there should be federal spending. And so he, he asks President Reagan, how do we get out of this? And President Reagan says, well, the problem is that people keep looking to the government for answers, but the <laughs> government is the problem. And I thought, I mean, you could, you know, you can tell it's from the 70s by what they're wearing and who they are, but we could be having that discussion right now. Why don't we think the government is a problem anymore? Or maybe I should put it more carefully. Why don't we think that too much unrestrained government is the problem? Right. And is it a problem? And, and what do we do about it? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I remember that interview. Do you? Yes. I wondered maybe if you would have seen it or. Yeah, I, I, I remember that interview. And uh, yeah, no, I, I think we've, this is our, this is the dilemma now that we face is how, how do you now at this point, right? 
uh, change or begin to introduce what we're talking about in a manner that it will be accepted, okay? I'm, I live here on Vancouver Island. I was only invited once into a school. I've never been invited into a high school. Okay. And during this pandemic and where I've spoken up and down the island, uh, I've spoken mostly in churches because they were the buildings that were the pastor would make them available. Whereas the more secular side of society did not or would not. Interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. And the only, there's universities on the island, as you know, University of Victoria and Royal Roads University and other university. And there's a university uh, 30 minutes from where I live by road, mm. Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo. And the only people who have invited me is, a, is are the students who just formed a new sort of free speech club. Oh, and, uh, good news. Yes, and they met me at a, an event where I was speaking, where I was invited by some of the citizens of Nanaimo to speak and the students heard about it and came to the event, told me what they were going to do. But isn't it interesting, right? So hmm. how, um, why have I not been invited to any of the public schools or any of the universities on Vancouver Island. Why have you not been invited by our government officials to help us work our way out of this? Exactly, exactly, right? So it, it's very interesting because I have a, and of course the Times columnist newspaper that used to carry my letters before the pandemic suddenly decided not to. National Post won't carry any of my letters. So I have been completely uh, eliminated uh, from and because of the travel restrictions that the federal government brought in, I can't go to Saskatchewan or Manitoba or the Maritimes or Ontario to speak like I've been. So I've been relegated to speaking on Vancouver Island and in Vancouver. Uh, and therefore, because it's too far to drive and I waste too much time. And so what I've been doing is Zooming because I can get more people involved that way now because I can't travel. If I could fly, I could easily get to a lot of these places in the same day and back again, for, the, for that matter, or do two or three at the same time. So I'm, I'm one of those people who have been restricted from giving that other side of the story in this um, uh, COVID kind of circumstance that we're in, which speaks volumes about us, what we've been trying to talk about here today. That's right, isn't it? It's so interesting and, and important and, and worth highlighting that mobility restrictions aren't just about preventing people from going on holiday. Exactly. Right? They're also exactly. about the, the spread, but also the, like the integration and exchange of different ideas. And my goodness, how can you grow as a person if you don't hear at least, you don't have to accept them all, entertain, but no. you know, how can we have any kind of, you know, and, and we haven't had one, what, town hall, citizens assembly, anything right. like that where we see our representatives, we're supposed to have representative government, right? right. Where our representatives right. are engaging with the people. And, um, you know, that's why, that's, that's why I say as part of that, the government's using section one of the charter, that they're completely wrong. They're wrong on two counts. They're wrong to say that they can be forgiven because they use the charter to never they want to, to, right. to, to suppress mm -hmm. uh, the, the rights and freedoms that are in the other parts of the charter. And mm -hmm. I argue uh, that number one, the intent of section one wasn't to be used in a circumstance like this to start with. Mm -hmm. And and the courts do consider intent. I've gone to the various mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Supreme Court of Canada judgments and actually found excerpts where the judge has been talking about intent. And so why don't they use intent on section one? And there's somebody alive who was there to help write it. And I can tell them what intent was. And the judge only has to go two sections down to section four, where we talk about insurrection and war, and that was supposed to be used in that sense. So, uh, you know, the, the other thing is to come to your point, e even if section one applied, there are four tests in, in, in section one that have to be met before you can even use it in war and insurrection. And one of them is, it must be consistent with a free and democratic society. 
okay? And that comes right to your point. What is a free and democratic society in Canada? It is parliamentary democracy. These are all of these 14 parliaments should have been open and there should have been select committees of these um, um, legislatures and parliaments whereby they invite into the parliament, they invite into the committee, experts from all fields, including your field and my field and the medical field to discuss these um, proposals that the government wants to bring in. And you could have even done it on an emergency basis. There's no reason. And even after that, now, even after that first 90 days, there were lots of times since then to, to re-examine what the governments were doing to see that they were consistent with the free and democratic society. All they did was, and the parliament sadly went along with this, is open them long enough to give the, the public health officers more power, then close the parliament immediately. And then it was all done by fiat, um, uh, authorized by that particular amendment that the parliament that sort of approved. So our parliamentary democracy and free and democratic society test was not met in section one. So if these uh, few judges that are still left at the appeal court level, courts of appeal of the provinces and Supreme Court of Canada, surely to goodness, surely to all that's good and holy as my mother or grandmother would say, that they will come <laughs> to the realization that if you look at the totality of the information, which is so readily available today, unlike any time in our history, as a, as a race, any time in our history is so available today that any common sense person has to come to the view that the, what the government has done was wrong. And so, uh, you know, our parliament, our, when you linked into parliamentary democracy there a few minutes ago, or uh, democracy, it has so been, uh, um, abuse in the last two years, that's the whole question of free and democratic society, that, that it's, it's, and, and it, it's, it, it's, it's so sad. By the way, to come back to travel, I want to mention to you, I get every day, I can read to you stories that'll make you cry. Every day from people who've lost their jobs, okay? I had a brother and a sister about three weeks ago now, every day I get them, every day. I've got a file of like this high, just of letters. People have actually used snail mail and written me. I just put away about five more cards and letters this morning into my file. Which ones to keep, which ones to, to, to sort of let go because getting, I'm getting so many of them. How about a, a, a sister and a brother who are, on Vancouver, are in Vancouver, the grandmother is in South Africa, and their grandmother is dying. She's just been told she's only got two or three months to live at most, a very um, fast growing cancer. And she's, they've done everything they could. She's got a few dollars. And so she gets hold of her, grand, her grandchildren and says to them, I have enough money. I'm buying, I'm getting something to buy tickets. So you can come to South Africa to see me before I die. But they can't. And they write me. The next day, a gentleman from Ontario drives to Vancouver Island to see a member of his family who's in a like circumstance, gets time off his work job, drives to Vancouver Island, sees his relative, is on his way to Victoria has an accident in his car and has a mild concussion and is told he can't fly because of his concussion and of course, because he wasn't vaccinated. His employer calls his wife in Ontario and says, where is John? Well, John has had an accident. I told him he had 10 days or 15 days or whatever, I need him back here. Well, he's not gonna get back anytime in maybe a few weeks or whatever. Job gone. He calls me. I don't know if there's a judge in this country that still gets up in the morning and has their coffee like the rest of us and has their breakfast and then, you know, gets involved in what's going on in society. I've got scores of these examples 
of people losing their jobs. I have one young, young lady, 32, 34 years old, who was a nurse here in this area and lost her job. She was a supervisor on night shift. Mm -hmm. And uh, her and her partner both lost their jobs and they moved, they moved to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Have come back since, hoping to, have come back since, have driven all the way back and are back because his father is dying in Saskatchewan. This is the kinds of stories that I'm getting every day mm -hmm. from people. And so there's, you know, there's so besides all of the reasons why, because I was there and helped create uh, the Charter Rights and Freedoms and the Constitution Act of 1982, uh, these kinds of stories alone would drive you to do the kinds of things that you and I are doing today. You, you just got to stand up and try to, to, to help these people. Uh, some way or another. And uh, when I was doing all of this talking, uh, it dawned on me one morning when I got up uh, that somebody in the, in the audience soon is going to say, Mr. Peckford, Brian, you're, what you're explaining, thank you very much. Uh, I know more about the Constitution than before <laughs> I came in and, uh, you know, and so on. But I'm, I was waiting for somebody to say, you're talking to talk. When are you going to walk the walk? Because, you know, people will say that to you. Uh -huh. And that dawned on me one morning, and that's what led me to take out my lawsuit against the federal government's travel ban, is because I've got to go the extra mile here. It's not enough for me to explain to people and try to explain to them that governments have overreached here and have def you know, defied the very uh, glue that keeps the country together, the thing called the Constitution. Um, but I've got to put this into action. And so that's why I did what I did. It's because I think it's important for people like me to really stand up and be counted, to give at least some hope. And that's what I get every day is that people you've given me hope. And so, you know, that's so important and for you as well and for all the rest of us who are trying to articulate it, that there is a way forward here, which is both democratic and free, but at the same time, protects individuals from various kinds of diseases which might come by from time to time. It is not a choice. We don't have to relinquish our rights and freedoms to protect people from various things that come by. And that is a false equation exactly. that the governments have created in the minds of people. It is not either or. But it's very convenient to divide us, isn't it? It was very convenient to divide us. And that's cruel. That is very cruel. And that's why I continue to say, and somehow like as we see the silence now coming, right? As you mentioned in your introduction, these people, whoever they are, have to be held accountable. There has to be accountability on this. Otherwise we can never move on. We can't reform or we can't have a Congress of citizens to look at new ways of governing our country, either reform or new ways of governing a country unless we eliminate and accommodate and take account of this blight that's been put on our democracy over the last two years. Unless we understand what our values really are. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, these stories of the people uh, who've lost their jobs and people who've you know, lost their marriages and their parents and their children yep. because of disagreements over COVID and people who are suffering vaccine injuries and nobody yep. will listen to them. Uh, children who are, you know, are being taken out of schools, university students are being de-enrolled. All these poor people like you, I don't think I get as many, but you know, every day I get stories yeah. from people in Canada and all over the world. And these poor people, it's like they're shouting in the dark and yeah. it's just an echo. They just hear their own voice back again. And it, it yeah. feels like to them that nobody's listening. Yeah. And however we move forward, it seems like we, we have to understand the value of listening to each other, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and hearing you talk, and I've heard you talk so many times before, and I'm so grateful for that. But, you know, and I think about the people in office who have arguably gotten us into this, or at least have not ever done a very good job of getting us out of this. And now we're looking at provincial elections in Ontario anyway, and then a federal election not too far down the road. And, 
you think that we have to be so careful what it is we put on our checklist, who, who qualifies as a good leader. And we're so obsessed with expertiseism and what is the, the subject matter experts, you know, and I remember when Trudeau took office and it was like this big deal that he appointed all of these sort of specialists in, into the, into the uh, offices. And all of those things are important and good, but it's no good to know a lot about economics or agriculture or health if you don't lack wisdom. And, and what I appreciate so much about what you did today and, and what you've been doing for months, decades, is framing all of the facts you know with wisdom and the willingness to question and the willingness to revise. And I just hope that um, many of us learn that lesson. And I will let you go soon, but do you have any last words for us? Words of hope, maybe? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm still hopeful that our judicial system will work. And this is what I say to people. I think we're in the second period, latter part of the second period, to use a hockey analogy, <laughs> which all Canadians will understand. And then we've got the whole third period to go, and that's Ooh. the Court of Appeal, and that's the Supreme Court of Canada. It may come down to about 25 people. You know, because I suspect it'll only be heard in the most five provinces, perhaps not that. So if you say three judges at the Court of Appeal in each province, right, five threes or 15, nine on the Supreme Court, that gets you 24. There might be 24 unelected people who are called judges who might decide whether this charter really means anything or not. Um, so I'm, but I'm still hopeful that we can turn this around and we'll be up to the judiciary one always upholds out the hope that there will be some government elected, either provincially or federally, who will say, I'm, 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 you know, I'm going to take a harder look at that. I think your other point is, and if you go to any employer, they will tell you this. And I will tell you, as ha having been an employer, not a government employer, a private sector employer as well, is that the generalist is so important. Um, the specialist, I was at my uh, optometrist yesterday. He knows absolutely nothing about what's going on in the world today. <laughs> How comforting. <laughs> you know, specialist, he, look, he looks at my eyes, right? He's got his machines and he's got his formulas and all the rest of them. And that's all he's interested in. Same way with my regular doctor, which I didn't have one for two years. There's millions of people in Canada, close to five million without, without a regular family physician now. For example, 17% of the population doesn't have a regular physician. My, my, so my closing remarks would be just simply, uh, and I think we have to exhaust all of the existing means at our disposal before mm -hmm. we, we seriously look at, at alternatives to the system we now have. And, uh, you know, I think that's very important. But it's coming, most of the people I now talk to and have been involved with me on this are seriously looking at what can we do different? How do we change the system all the way from the, you know, the, the whole constitution, the whole bit. And uh, I'm still in the realm of, have, you know, because I have this lawsuit underway, that there's still some hope that there will be some judges who will say, look, this charter really means something. This charter will violate it. And we have to look at ways now of am amending the kinds of actions that were taken by governments. They were wrong, they were unconstitutional. I guess the great question and one of the things that the judges may be very seriously considering and therefore having a real problem with is what, what is the ultimate punishment? What is the ultimate, uh, how do you rectify this when people have died, right? People have lost jobs and that there's somebody responsible for this provincially and federally. So, and and they, that might be one of the reasons the, judici the, the judiciary up to now in the court system has been reluctant to move in, in that direction is that, that they back off from, because they know that once they make that kind of a decision, there's also other decisions to come as to how now do you rectify this and how do you make, hold these people accountable? Big, big question but that they were appointed to interpret the law as is. The other problem we have in closing is just simply this, is that the judiciary up to now have even ignored parts of the charter. This is most uh, disturbing 
the charter begins with, whereas this country is founded Thank on the God. principles of the supremacy of God mm -hmm. and the rule of law, colon, as I keep remember, reminding people as a former English teacher, but not only as a former English teacher, <laughs> is that it means something, because that's why it was put there. There were other alternatives. You could have put a period there. You could have put a, right, a comma <laughs> went on for something else, or you, whatever. It's a colon, which means there's things to follow. In other <laughs> words, this is to be considered in the context of the supremacy of God and the rule of law. In some court decisions, that's not even mentioned. That is part of the charter. And the judge has an obligation, has an obligation in interpreting the law to consider what the context is into which this is placed. Mm -hmm. And this was placed into the context of the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And that's how it must be interpreted until it's changed, if ever. And so I find that most disturbing. And there are a lot of legal beagles around who completely ignore what I just said. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I'm a generalist because I'm not now caught in a certain formula of law creation out of a law school of the last 50 or 40 or 30 years, mm -hmm. right? And so I can speak about it in the more common sense approach rather than the more legalistic approach. And I do know that words matter and that those words in the charter are just as important as other words in the charter and the judge shouldn't have the liberty of deciding which of these words are important and which are not. They're all supposed to be, if they bear upon the decision that he's making. You know, I think our um, lack of willingness to or interest in referring to our constitution and charter is part and parcel with the same reluctance or inability to engage with what happened during the Holocaust. Right. And this is, will take us into another conversation and yes. I'll have to go for now, but um, we need to be better historians. And, and by that, I just mean a lay, lay people, being well-read, understanding. We need to be better informed as citizens. Mm -hmm. We need to be civically engaged and we're not. We need to get back to, I, I was said to in a couple of, uh, late meetings where uh, the people said, wow, yeah. I said to them, uh, why don't you start tomorrow with your group now that you're forming and go to your MLA and say, we want to meet with you once every 90 days hmm. or quarterly, whatever they can say, quarterly, but don't make it any less than quarterly, every three months or whatever, right? And, and have a meeting with you to find out what you have been doing for <laughs> us in the last right quarter. And, and what, are your, the fire. What, what is your party, party proposing to do when the house when it reopens? And do that both at the federal level and the municipal level. We'd have a much more, right, uh, what shall I say, enlightened government, our parliament, if that was done on a regular basis right across the country, right? We should, that should be done. I don't know if you're aware or not, but there are quite a few people in, in Canada today who are already gone to alternate forms of things in their society. For example, right here in the area I am, people, <clears throat> the homeschoolers, people who've already taken their kids out of the public school are forming their own schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As part of the homeschool process, forming their own schools. They're out of the, the, the system that we're in now. And of course, so th this is happening and this will not be, this will be discordant if we're looking at a new, you know, how do we reform our system to make it work better, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's so important that pe people become engaged. So my last words would be, don't give up. I'm, we're still trying to see that the judiciary works for us, but at the same time, if we're going to look at something more medium and long-term, you've got to become more engaged in your community, in your province, and in your federal system. Otherwise, it will fail. Very wise, hopeful words. Thank, thank you so much for this. And by that, I mean the conversation today, but also the conversations and the, the speeches that you've been giving for months and months and the work you've been doing for Canada for decades. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, too, and thank you for being so involved. We'll keep fighting. Absolutely.
Thanks for hanging out with me today. If you enjoyed watching this video, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the democracyfund.ca slash donate.